And is everyone here? No. Yes. No. Uh, who are we missing? I believe we're all here aside from Sierra. Great. Uh, oh. So I would like to call for the approval of the minutes from the last meeting. Can I, um, um, oh, but before I call for that, does anyone have any amendments to those minutes? Okay. They should be on the screen now. I've read through them and I move to approve the minutes as submitted. Can I get a second? Second. Um, all in favor, uh, aye. say aye. 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 <clears throat> it's are approved. Uh, so next we have the uh, regular board business and I believe that um, the first thing we're going to do is watch the next trustee short takes yep. and then discuss. Um, and I again don't know if I hit let my sound go so I'm going to just do that one more time and we'll share some sound to make sure everyone can get it. Uh, this one is a shorter one. It's just about eight, nine minutes on this. So, Welcome to Short Takes for Trustees. I'm Beth Novolinsky, the Director of Marketing and Communications for United for Libraries. We are the division of the American Library Association for trustees, advocates, friends, and foundations. I'm here today with our Executive Director, Sally Gardner-Reed, and we're speaking about board ethics. Sally, I know it's very important for boards to act with the highest level of integrity, and I know most do. Can you tell us a little bit more about this? Yes, actually it goes back to their fiduciary responsibilities. But I want to say before I continue that what I'm going to talk about would be really good standards for advisory boards as well. So in the nonprofit world, um, ethic, ethical responsibilities for fiduciary boards really are broken down into three categories. The duty of care, the duty of loyalty, and the duty of obedience. The duty of care really is to be prepared. So earlier we talked about those board packets and the importance of boards actually reading those board packets. And it is very important for boards to stay up to date, not only with the board packets, but for all the information that they're provided and what's going on in the library world at the national state and certainly at the local level. Boards make a lot of very important decisions and are asked to make those decisions, setting policies and all the wonderful things that they do if they do them without being well informed, they really are being negligent in their duty of care. The second is duty of loyalty, and that means that the library always comes first. They always have to set aside their own personal interests and never can take advantage of their role as a trustee um, at the expense of the library. So for example, they cannot use their position on the board to bid on contracts. They can't use their position to have fines waived at the library or to take an advantage on um, the waiting list for popular titles. They cannot use the patron um, records for their own use, that sort of thing. So that's a very important standard that the library always comes first in the duty of loyalty. And the final one is duty of obedience. And that's really knowing the mission and keeping the library's mission front and center, never thwarting that mission or bending it to divert library resources to another agency, even if it's another similar nonprofit agency. The library's mission always comes first. Are these the only examples of ethical behaviors? No, there are other um, potential breaches of ethics. We talked earlier in another webcast about um, board members speaking out once a board decision has been made and certain board members perhaps speaking out against that decision when they didn't agree with it. That's an example of um, a breach of ethics. When a board decision is made, it becomes the collective decision of the board, the board speaks with one voice. So it is a breach of ethics for an individual board member or several board members in the minority to speak out against a decision that the board um, has voted on and approved. I've heard of cases where board members or a board member speak to the staff about the library director's performance or how staff morale is. Is that okay? 
frankly, I can't think of any occasion when it would be okay for a board member or a couple of board members to speak to staff about a uh, director's performance. First of all, no board member singularly or even in a handful of board members should ever act on their own without full board authority. That's first of all. And secondly, um, that's a way to really undermine the director. They should never get in between the director and his or her staff. If there are concerns about the director's performance, they should be talking to the director, him or herself, and not going directly to staff. That's just an occasion for real um, dysfunction within the library. And also, it's an occasion for potential loss suit because if the director is in any way um, reprimanded or treated in improperly by this staff person say so that could really lead to some major litigation so I, it's very imprudent. How about the other way around? How about a staff member going to a board member about complaints about the director? That will happen from time to time when a staff member is disgruntled. And the best way for a board member to handle that is to point that a staff member to the, his or her supervisor and let the staff member go through the proper chain of command. There should, of course, be a grievance procedure in place, a policy that will help address those concerns. Normally, it is um, a step-by-step -step procedure where the staff member goes to the supervisor and it has an escalation where finally it does come to the board if it can't be resolved at a lower level. If, in fact, there isn't a grievance procedure in place, the board member should ask that staff member to speak to the supervisor and at the very next board meeting that board member should um, let the board know that they need a grievance procedure right away. <laughs> How about when trustees search office records because they suspect malfeasance or just want to audit the spending? Is that okay? Don't they have a right and responsibility to make sure that the library funds are being used properly? Well, again, I would say, first of all, that no one or several trustees should be acting on their own without full board approval. So that's the first thing. Secondly, if the full board suspects any kind of malfeasance, they should be talking in executive session with their director. Um, and also, if there is signs and probable cause for malfeasance, they should be talking to the attorney, their attorney and perhaps even the police. Um, also, as far as their responsibility goes in terms of monitoring and auditing the library's spending, there should be a very firm procedure in place for the trustees to monitor on a regular basis all income and expenditures of the library. Do you have any final thoughts on board ethics to share with us? The fact of the matter is that most boards, in fact, I would say probably 99% of boards act ethically all the time without even thinking about it. But it's good to have a formal standard practice in place to ensure that there are no pitfalls and nobody accidentally makes a misstep. So there should be an ethics statement for all board members to sign. There should be a an evaluation for the library director. There should be a procedure in place to monitor income and expenditures. There should be a singular spokesperson for the board, and that typically would be the board president or chair. And there should never be public dissension um, by a few of the board members against a board um, decision. Everybody should have an opportunity to express their opinion within board meetings. All of the things that we've talked about help make sure that the board moves ahead ethically and responsibly and maintains that high degree of um, integrity. Thank you, Sally. This was a really good discussion about board ethics. And like you said, most boards are, are doing very well. But we have compiled a list of resources that our viewers can access. Uh, they'll be provided by the, by the library director. And we encourage our viewers to look over those resources. And if you have any questions, go ahead and discuss those with your library director. Thank you. So I just want to echo uh, what they said, like 99% of boards are doing great. I feel like we are too. This was just number three of our third month. So we're just going in order. Uh, and that's what I had. I don't know if the board had any other business 
under board business. Doesn't sound like it. Um, does anyone have any like thoughts or questions about the video that we just saw? Great. Um, hey, do you would you mind? Bleh, would you mind? Um, thank you. That's exactly what I was going to answer. Okay. Um, so next on our agenda is the library manager report. Same question, does everyone have their copy that I emailed you or would you like me to put that up on the screen as well? Would you mind putting it on the screen? Absolutely can. Patrick, it was nice to see this report in advance of the meeting. So it was very nice. I did. I did my job. We're not going to be able to play magician with the big, you know, the show or whatever the the term is for the big presentation. But it, it is nice to have have it on reserve here. Yeah. So what I did is I just looked at physical circulation for you all for this year. Um, we're continuing to circulate, we're holding steady. Every year as you go through, there's always kind of a lull around the holidays. And so you can see that we were, um, July was when we first started checking things out again. That's why I did, we would have had zero new circulation from March to July. And so that's why I didn't add that on there to that first uh, chart that we see there. Um, and then normally there'll be that lull right before Christmas and it picks up again. Uh, so what I can do for next month, if you're interested, is last year compared to this year. But obviously, I, I assumed that you all understood and care er, and realized last year to this year, we've seen a drop just because we haven't been open since March. Obviously, our numbers are going to go down. Uh, but still holding steady, the, the thing that has been uh, exciting to me is that the percentage of our circulation where we have automatic renewals has gone down. Uh, what I mean by that is from uh, March at the beginning of the pandemic, clear through, we just automatically renew. If there's not a hold on an item, it's getting checked out to you again. And so that counts and these numbers of, okay, well, we recirculated the item one time to you. But now that we've been able to open up more people, that percentage of our total checkouts has gone more to people checking out an item the first time than to just forgetting about the book and having it sit on their shelves. So that is a very, um, I guess, optimistic, a, a very promising to me view of how our circulation is going as people are using the library more on that first time basis than before. Um, the next one that I wanted to do was just kind of show you last year total to this year total. I've mentioned this in months past, um, the uh, circulation for our eBooks, our e-resources has just grown. There's two months, you can see on that chart that it actually decreased October of 2019 to this last October and then December. But that decrease was, if my math is right, six and eight was the decrease where we're jumping by a hundred or so in July. And over so overall, those numbers, we've increased about 500 extra checkouts of our e-resources just during the, that period, not counting the beginning part of the pandemic when all we had was e-resources as well. So um, I unfortunately don't have an answer for why that is. I don't know what we've been doing different. I don't have any explanation for the increase. I don't believe we've been marketing anymore. It hasn't been out on the sign out front, uh, but it's encouraging for me to see that those are increasing even with the lack of uh, marketing and that people are aware of it, just knowing that we can market those going forward and see how much more that circulation continues to rise. So that's what I had for circulation. 
Was there any question on that part before we moved on? For, is, oh, sorry, go ahead, go ahead, Stephen. Yeah, Patrick, question. Uh, for this ebook, is there data available on what types of titles or, you know, Library of Congress code? I can, yeah. That, so that the interest is in terms of, is it that is a report books, that older books, fiction, I can, fiction? I can ask them to make up the report by item, uh, not type, but all the search terms that you would go through in Libby or in Overdrive. They can break down the report at that level. We just don't get that report defaulted to us. So I can absolutely ask uh, a more it's, detailed level. It's mainly if it makes a difference on, and I don't know if it does, on whether there are future opportunities to say, okay, for just another $35 you know, a year, you can add 2,000 more titles in this category. But if we have no checkouts in that category, it isn't worth $35, but. Yeah, um, and I know that we do have, yeah, I can, I can look into more details and I will try to create that for the next meeting if we have it available at that point. Thank you. Was it Leslie that had the other question? Yeah, I, Patrick, I just want to know, have you heard, how are the wait times, how, are the wait times for titles improving on Libyan Overdrive? Because I know that that's been a concern and I know like the state library has given um, money to buy more electronic resources, but have you seen an improvement or like with this increased usage, is that even worse? Um, so my understanding is that it has remained really about the same, uh, the wait time. So the circulation is increasing and the wait is the same. Yeah. So we have, we do have, just so everyone knows, I, I don't know, again, still I'm playing the new card for the next two years. So not <laughs> knowing where we're at as far as that goes. Um, we have a general overdrive collection that everyone in the consortia has a part of and then we have some advantage titles is what they're called that we buy so that our patrons can have access to that as well um, what that means for you is as a patron if you log in you see everything combined it doesn't matter who bought it it all just looks like it's coming from the same place to you but if you had a library card that was issued from uh, a different library, even in the same consortia, so Monmouth or Salem or somewhere else, you wouldn't see those specific titles that we have purchased for our patrons on their own. And so this report here is all of the titles checked out by all of the patrons, not just our Advantage titles, not just our Advantage patrons right there. So all of the, all of the Independence patrons, I should say. So this isn't everyone in CCRLS's uh, report. This is just the independence checkouts there. But um, that hasn't really, my understanding, done much for hold times. I can check and see. Uh, well, I was gonna say, cause I just got an email that a book I put um, on hold nine months ago is finally available. Um, so I was, I was more curious cause um, because what happens is the state library gives money, but that's to the general, mm. the general, not to the advantage. So yes, correct. Any other circulation questions, or did, did I answer that one, Leslie? You answered that. I was okay. it was more of a curiosity question. Um, I was just wondering how the increased usage has, if it's affected the whole times at all. Gotcha. Okay, see nothing. The next thing I wanted to update with you all on was the weeding project. So this is a copy of the report that I get. Um, I retyped it up and didn't put in all of their columns that are blank because they don't apply to us, but this is all the numbers. And I just wanted to kind of explain what each thing was and what that means when the friends will actually get money because these all are a lot of numbers. And if you don't know what they mean, they just are numbers, right? So uh, the way that it works is we've only gotten reports for December and January, because that's when they finally got all of our items there, finally got them added to their website and were able to start selling. 
So gross sales is the total amount that all of those items sell for. And then the market commission, I, I reached out and asked them to kind of explain that a little more. That is if Better World, Better World Books, for example, sells through Amazon and Amazon takes a cut, that market commission is the cut that Amazon takes right there or whatever the website is. So that's what the net sales number is, is just gross sales minus the commission of whatever site they use to sell them. If they're not selling them on their own, leaves them with the net sales. So that's what we've got. And then client commission, we are the client, or in this case, the friends of the library are the client because that's who they're cutting the check to. And so that's the percent that we knew all along, we would be getting about 10% a little bit less, 9% of those cells when they uh, cut the checks. Uh, and I double checked with them. They send out checks quarterly and only if in the quarter you've made $100, right? So if you've made $100, then they'll send you the check right there. If you're under that, but above 50, they'll just roll it over to the next quarter and then they would add that. So if we stopped right here, we're over 50, but under a hundred. That means that the next quarter, they would roll this $60 and 69 cents over to our next check. Does that make sense? And then anything- Under 50. Anything under 50, they just roll into their costs because they've paid for shipping, they've paid for boxes, they've paid for anything like that. Now, I don't see that Ooh. being an issue. Uh, for a couple reasons. First of all, we've been above that even with just getting started. And second of all, one of the main reasons we're doing this is to just move the books out. And so the fact that they are boxed up and sent to someone else and not our problem is that is a win in my book right there. So if we get checks back for the friends on top of getting the books gone, then we are doing great. I agree. And when the bookstore at the old library was open during better times, uh, we would probably average about 100 to 120 a quarter from the sales. So it replaces it probably just it, it close to it anyway. So I think this is great. Does the uh, Better World Books, they have their own websites, welcome, but they use other websites as well? They do, yes. Okay. So just because they specialize in a certain type where they know people are going to go look for Better World Books for one thing and look for Amazon for a different, uh -huh. then they will, usually what they do is they'll list them on both. But if people buy it through Better World Books, they don't have to pay Amazon for having it listed. They just pull the Amazon listing or something similar. I see. Thank you. Mm-hmm. And then like Nancy mentioned, uh, I don't see this fighting uh, or, you know, being against what we do with the old library, with the book sale that the friends run. I see this being a supplement too, because we'll still be able to sell over there and then just have this running at the same time because we're sending different items to both places. I, I agree there. I don't see any, any conflict at all. I think it is it's something that just supplements what we're doing. So. It's a good thing. Okay. And then I just realized that the last financial note here, I'm going to share a different thing. Assuming you want to see that financial record as well. Yes. Yes, please. And is it too small? Probably. It is not. There we go. Can everyone see that on the screen? Is it big, little? Yeah. So the big numbers to pay attention for me anyway, since this was the end of December. So this was the 50% of the year is spent or 50% of the year is gone. And so these percents at the very end is what I've been trying to pay attention to. 52% of our uh, salary and benefits is gone. And that was anticipated. And then we're at 46 of our expenditures overall, 23% at just what we've got running to buy books, to do things like that. You can look and see the things that we've talked about in the past. Our insurance obviously is done. 
but it was done at the beginning of the year when that payment was due. Same with, yeah, licenses and permits. So I believe we're on track. I know that we've got a uh, big chunk coming out for AV materials. We just made a, uh, a, a big DVD purchase there. Uh, same with books. Uh, those are starting to trickle in those Better World books payments that are only due once the item's actually shipped, not when you purchase it, so. So, uh, so that, yeah, that, that if you answer your question, the, the revenue, the money, the check or whatever that you receive from Better World, is that gonna go to the friends? Yep, they're making the check out to the friends of the library. Okay. okay. So, so we won't see that revenue at all yeah. Uh, the way that our donations have handled the policy that we've had is that all of the donations, all excuse me, all of our discards go to the friends to take care of. However, since these are discarded, it is the check is going to the friends from Better World Books instead of, okay. yeah. Just, just making sure. Yep. <laughs> I think they've got our mailing address, but we'll just. Toss yeah, it in so with that everything is, else. That's the friends mailing address. It's the library. So the clock then is what do you think you're going to move around in order to get seventy five hundred? Um, right. <laughs> <laughs> um if we can, I've got to double check, but that uh, about halfway down repairs and maintenance on the building. Yeah. If we can get a large chunk of it from there, especially where we've only spent 20% of the money so far. Right. Um, I also, I know that we can, I don't want it to be a, um, uh, an ongoing oppression. I don't want it to, I don't want to have the money and then lose it for next year but where oh. all of our trainings this year have been online. The Association for Rural and Small Libraries this year was all online. And so instead of having to pay airfare and hotels and per diem for people to attend, it was $50 each. And we also got a scholarship from the state. So three of us actually attended that training right there and spent a hundred bucks, right? <laughs> now, next year, they're hoping to have it in person. Uh, this year, I know Oregon State the Oregon State Library Association, Oregon, OLA, Oregon Library Association, that's also virtual this spring. Yeah. So again, we won't have the travel costs associated with that. Um, if we have to pull from that to get the clock fixed for this fiscal year, I am fine with doing that with the caveat of not wanting to lose that money to send people off for additional training next year, because I know that it's, harder to get money back if you've had it and give it up than if you just don't give it up. Right, understood. So what are your, so if I'm reading this right, you have 11,839 left for repairs and maintenance? Uh, or is that what you spent? Yes, you are reading, you are reading okay. that correct. That's unexpended, that call. Yeah, so that, sorry, I couldn't tell. Um, so, what since we don't have people in the buildings right now what has been like the monthly cost so far of like building and like maintenance currently well i i if i'm understanding the question maintenance has been uh just our janitorial services okay. uh is all there uh i do know that at some point uh it's been mentioned by the city that we do need to restripe, and I don't know if it's reseal or just restripe the parking lot where the lands are going on. Uh, I don't know if that was anticipated and put in the budget. I'd need to check with them since the budget was made before or submitted before I got here if that was anticipated for this fiscal yeah. year or if it was a mentioned to me, hey, put this in the budget for next fiscal year kind of thing. But that has been mentioned as well. And then, uh, most of most of that actually has gone to sealing the the roof leaks. Okay, 
and the other thing I was going to mention is office supplies. Um, I'm assuming you're not using a lot right now. Could you pull part of it from that budget? Potentially, yeah. Okay. Um, a lot of what that is actually is if you look at the equipment, the rent equipment, uh, that is just me marking the wrong thing down. So we get our copiers and we, we have both of the patrons that we use currently as well as our copier and printer are rented from Pacific. Oh, okay. And so that's just me when I first sat down and started paying bills, not realizing that the line item for that should have come out of office supplies instead of office. Oh, okay. rent. So that's why that's first of all, why that one's at 70% and we're only 50% through the year. Cause I've put the wrong line item there and haven't gotten those fixed, but that is another potential source too. So office supplies, travel, and then repairs to get that clock. Taken I, 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 this is my, I agree with you that I, you probably don't want to zero out your training budget just, and because you might lose it next year, because I'm also assuming that next fiscal year, the budget is going to be tighter due to COVID and all the stuff going yeah. on. So you, I, you probably don't want to zero that out. Um, as well. So if you could pull from, I think a few places that would probably be better. Mm -hmm. That, and I'm not sure uh, if you've had any conversations with the city manager and customer, but um, my other life and place of work, oftentimes it was kind of um, when some of these unforeseen physical plant type things popped up, it was, gee, if your unit will come up with half, I'll come up with half. I don't know if that ever happens at the city level. Or if the clock uh, absolutely has to be paid for repaired by the library budget. I can I can check with him. I've got a, actually a meeting with him tomorrow. So I'll see. Yeah, what that's he a says good there. call. I mean, yeah, it's a good call if maybe we approach them and, you know, the library is a city building. So maybe if we could come up with some of the more most of the money they could at least pitch in. This was kind of an unforeseen expenditure. And who was yeah, and it just in, wasn't put in the budget this last year. And if I might uh, ask, like, are we getting a lot of pressure to fix the clock? I mean, <laughs> no, it's just that a couple of citizens of Independence are driving Patrick crazy, right, Matthew? Uh, not me. <laughs> uh, I don't like reached out to other people in the city building about it, though. Oh, OK. Which I would then yeah. comes down to me. Okay, I was just more curious about like, I mean, if we prioritize like, we're in kind of a situation where I think we need to prioritize like what is important um, to like our community and keeping the library services that we need. Um, so, I mean, if we're getting pressure, I mean, that's important to take into consideration, but I also think we should maybe also take into consideration the other priorities that we have serving our community right now. For sure. It would I be also, nice to have I a functional clock. Appreciate. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it would be nice to have a functional clock. We have a uh, another companion city that you know finally took their clock down, but uh, this it is makes the corner very nice and attractive. And I do appreciate the, especially now, some sort of sense of normal. And so if having a functioning clock gives people that sense of normal, then that's the least I can do. Patrick, I have a question about the very first line of programs. Yes. They've been budgeted for what, 6,000 and nothing's been spent. Is that because most of all the programs are being paid for with the friends? Uh, that and most of that money will come out for summer reading. Oh, okay. We're gonna wait till summer. Okay. Yeah. So that is that is the plan. So I just Patrick, I just had one question on the budget. Um yeah. I noticed that this is all general fund. Is there um is there does the a library have any grants? Uh we do, uh, but they are all rolled into additional summer funds as well. The way the way that the budget for the library was explained for me was explained to me was that 
uh, just a simple number. I hope that's okay. Uh, not using the numbers here, but if the library's budget was 500,000, then the city would fund us 500,000. And if we got a grant for 100,000, then the city would fund us for 400,000. So our budget is going to be the same regardless of whether we get grants or not. So what this is, and, and that might be me misunderstanding, uh, but what this is, is I, uh, all of the revenue, sorry, I'll scroll back to where we were. And just, this was all just expenditures. So you knew where we were at with what the city uh, budgeted for us, regardless of source of funding. Well, that seems kind of crazy because what's the incentive to get grants? Exactly. <laughs> Well, most of the grants, like when we were building capital, when we were building the library, we came to the Friends. The, most of the donors would donate to the Friends of the Library, which is pretty, pretty common thing to do, I guess, rather than actually give a grant to the city. We'd give it to the Friends of the Library. So that way it didn't affect the budget. But, but there are grants out there that are specific to libraries. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. But if but if your overall budget's going to, I mean, if your general fund budget will be reduced, I mean, I don't, I, I can't see the incentive for getting a grant. It, it'd be nice to clarify that. Yeah, that was just, and, and then in looking back through, because that is what is reported in that annual report to the state, looking in years past, it's zeroed out for last decade plus. Mm -hmm. So was this year, as this last fall, as I submitted, that's when I sat down with city finance to try and have that explained to me. How do I know what numbers to put in here? And it just is that it zeroes out. So. Well, I know that the budget zeroes out each, each year I'm on, um, you know, June 30th, you start with a brand new budget and what you don't spend is gone. And that makes perfect sense. But my concern is, you know, should you go out and you get a thousand dollar grant for say kids programs, you know, I, I wouldn't want to see the, the city's contribution be reduced by a thousand to, you know, to make that a total of 6,000, you know, I would like to see that be 7,000. So I'm just saying, you know, if you get a, the incentive to, I mean. Well, that's why I was just saying that, that they, they give it to the friends of the independent public library. And we put it into our bank account. And then the librarian asks us for money for a particular program or children's program. And then we take it out of the Friends of the Library. So I get, I get donations you know, a lot in the past from all kinds of uh, institutions and Walmart and places like that, and grants specifically for children's library. Okay. Yeah, Patrick, this would be a, a good conversational topic just to get a being new in this um, in the library directorship to get a feel for how does your efforts at going out for outside grant money affect the actual library budget because administrators, and I've been one, we love to sweep money into other accounts to cover shortages somewhere else, but, um, but it would be good for you to, to know exactly how any grants that you go after will be handled by the city. Yeah, I will definitely follow up. And, and I just to let uh, Peggy know, I 100% agree. I, I hear what you're saying on what's the motivation if it's just gonna even out in the end. Right. right, and I get that. So I will check. Uh, I'll, I will check that I understand it correctly first of all. Mm -hmm. That it was explained to me correctly. But um, if not, I'd sure like to have that change so that there is a reason to go out for grants to increase. Right. Uh, it doesn't not that the friends are not valuable, or, or that we don't want to use them when we use them, but that we're not putting the burden on them being the people that have to sign the MOA or the MOU for any grant or any responsibility for reporting going back on the friends instead of on the library is getting it anyway, so. Right. Yeah, if you were to go out for a grant to for new computers, 
and yeah. you had a fifteen thousand dollar grant, which is that would be kind of cool. You know, I don't want to see you be punished fifteen thousand dollars for receiving that grant. Yeah. So. I 100% agree. Anyway, so that is, I think, all of the items that were on my director's report. So I'll go ahead and stop screen sharing. I did want everyone to know it has been briefly discussed and decided. Uh, if you recall, we did kind of a trick or treat uh, book giveaway on Halloween because that was the day of our curbside. Our staff is preparing to do a Valentine's Day book giveaway. We've still got a stack of free books to give away. So we're going to do that on the 13th, which is the day before Valentine's Day for our curbside there. And then uh, in an emails, this is coming hot off of the email uh, this morning, the consortia CCRLS, uh, I if I have not discussed this in the past, and this is big news, I apologize. I think I have though. The consortia and the college got a grant for hotspots. Does this sound familiar? Yes, okay. They have been processed and should be coming and ready. They should be starting to come to libraries this Friday. And so we can start doing our marketing to let people know those hotspots are available to check out. We will be getting 10 of them for independent. Hey. Are there groups that you're planning on partnering with to market those? Like I'm thinking like the school district. Absolutely. Because, yep. Yeah. Okay. Because I know that there's some children who have internet issues. Yes. Okay. And Patrick, this is Marilyn. What time is the Valentine book giveaway on the 13th? It is going to be just during our normal curbside hours from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Thank you. I'll put a little advertising out for you on that. Thank you. Since we missed the, we didn't decide to do that until after we already got the uh, water utility newsletter into the city. So, right. I appreciate it. Thank you, Marilyn. Anyway, so that's it for me. Okay. Uh, then, does anyone have any questions? Um, Patrick, regarding the hotspots, and, and previously we talked about holding off. Maybe we did this and I just don't recall, but the policy on how to check out hotspots that you wanted to use kind of a universal policy that the very the library consortium was doing. And I can't recall, had we officially endorsed that that's how it was going to be done at the Independence Library? Or was that something that was supposed to come back up whenever the hotspots became a reality? Uh, yeah, so that will be correct. Uh, uh, we were waiting on them to adopt something. And so we, uh, I'm looking at my calendar. We will officially adopt it at CCRLS and then just copy paste for the board. Okay. It should be for you in the next board packet adopted at the next meeting. Uh, most likely it will be a retroactive adoption on the board's part of saying, hey, we're just going to follow along with what CCRLS has done. We've created two different groups of those uh, hot spots, one that is a 30 day and one that's a 90 day checkout, or excuse me, 21 day and one that's 90 day. So people can ask for whatever version of that they want. Uh, if we at independent see that we have, we're going to start with 50-50, so five shorter checkouts and five longer checkouts. If we see that people are needing more shorter and the long checkout ones aren't going out or they're being returned, then we can change what quote unquote type they are so that they follow that rule that way. Um, the grant has specific uh, rules in place that the college has to follow as far as uh, fine money and reimbursement for lost devices. So we just followed the grant uh, regulations right there. Basically any money that you get for those has to go back into the grant. And so we uh, just made it replacement costs. It's not going to continue to add up for people if they don't get them back or if they, do, if they lose them. And as we discussed in the past, if someone refuses to bring it back, we just can let uh, it's going to be housed at Chemeketa because they're, they're, excuse me, at CCRLS because it's their grant. 
but they can go into the little dashboard engine, just turn off the internet. And then the user has a really fancy hockey puck, but that is all they really have to use anything with there. Thank you. So yeah, the, the draft will be ready for adoption and export me. Great. Um, any other questions before we move on to the next agenda item? Great. Uh, so is there any unfinished business? Okay. Um, do we have any new business? It looks like we're going to discuss the strategic plan. Uh, Patrick, usually there's a bullet point in here for Friends of the Library update. Okay. Is that normally under new business or under unfinished or is it's it usually, its own bullet point? It's usually its own bullet point, um, but we could do it under new business if we want right now. Um, but, I will make sure that there's a bullet point for the friends going forward. Yeah. So um, do we want to do that now before we talk about the strategic plan? Well, you know, I would normally have a lot to say, except that <laughs> <laughs> we're not meeting the friends of the library uh, the most of the membership is very low tech so we don't do zoom meetings right Marilyn that's right Mar Marilyn is the president so maybe you ought to take over on it and I have the financial information then, but that's that's, that's very all we're going to have right now for any kind of report because the uh, store the the bookstore is being kept closed for now and the friends haven't been meeting. So we're on um, an indefinite hiatus until we can get back together in person. We have put out one brief newsletter to the friends just to say what's actually what's not been happening. And we may do that one more time before, before this uh, pandemic lets loose. And if that's the case, then we'll let you know. And, uh, I, I, I haven't added up uh, the most recent balance, but in the bank account, we had 12784 um, And we've had uh, only $170 in donations in Stormbrook so far since um, October. So that, that's pretty low. We usually get a lot at Christmas time and we, we did it this year. Um, but we continue to keep track of, of the expenses and the donations and the costs and, and our um, membership by postcards, <laughs> even though it is kind of low tech. But uh, um, yeah, it wouldn't be a problem to have a bullet point there just in case some exciting. Well, uh Thank you. Um, does anyone have any questions for Marilyn or Nancy about the friends? Okay. Uh, if not, uh, let's we'll move on to the new business and um, talk about the strategic plan. Okay. So at our last meeting, we talked about the strategic plan and me getting a copy of that to you. Uh, Patrick, I think you're muted. I hope not. I'm hearing him at my end. I'm hearing him. Oh, Peggy said that you could barely hear me. Can you barely hear me? I will I will step closer to the mic. Yes, no. I, I can hear you fine. I can hear you. I can hear you too. I will mute and unmute one more time just for double check. Any better, Leslie? I think it might be on Leslie's end. Okay. Well, I don't know what to tell you, Leslie. <laughs> uh, but for everyone else, uh, so that we can keep everyone, I did mention at the end of the last meeting that I would get you a copy of the strategic plan, uh, except that doesn't exist. The city no longer has a copy or 
didn't have a copy. Uh, in talking to everyone, they cannot track one down. I cannot find a physical copy that I was able to swear I saw in the past, which means we need to come up with a new strategic plan is really what that comes up for, uh, comes down to, I guess. And so I am comfortable writing a strategic plan. Really the reason this is on the agenda is because I would ask for uh, no more than two, uh, but just a couple volunteers who want to help me brainstorm this first part and then we can come up with a draft and see where to go from there. So I just need two volunteer slash guinea pigs who want to do that with me. Uh, I'll do it. <laughs> Leslie, you can hear me, yay! Yay, sorry, that was, I, oh, my, I was having computer issues. That was my fault. Okay, I've got uh, you written down, Leslie. I'm, I'm happy to help too. Okay. Good. Great. Okay, I will also, I'm going to be reaching out to uh, staff and then some other community partners that we may have just to see what they, where they think we should be headed to. Um, I can get you two copies of the one from 2006 or 2014 that I can track down, but that doesn't really do us any good, uh, really, other than seeing, and I'm sure that we'll change the format from what it was to what it needs to be for us. Uh, and uh, Patrick, the other thing you might wanna do is reach out to the State Library and the Library Support Division. They have lots of resources around like strategy, um, especially for smaller libraries like ours. Um, and I know that Buzzy, um, who's the director of that group is very helpful. So for sure. um, that they might have some resources just to get you started. Oh, absolutely. Um, and then just as a, I guess, a, to my own horn, I did present on how to write a strategic plan at the ARSL conference this last okay. fall. So it's very fresh on my mind. We might as well do our own, so. Yes, um, yeah. But that was why that, that's why strategic planning was on the agenda is because we need to come up with one. So. We need to have one. That's we always, will. yeah, <laughs> it's always good to have a plan. <laughs> Uh, and I, I re recognize what Nancy said. I do think it's important. You mentioned last month, Nancy, uh, what does our strategic plan look like with us being closed? Uh, it, different, but we can still set goals and then move goalposts if we need to. So that is important to realize where we're at, but also where we want to be. Yeah. Um. And that is all I've got for strategic planning. Thank you, Stephen and Leslie for volunteering. Um, so if no, if does any, before we adjourn, does anyone have any questions or comments they want to add before we wrap this up? Okay, so um, I move to adjourn the meeting. Um, can I get a second? Second. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, yeah. Well, thank you everybody for coming um, today. And it was nice to see you all. And um, we'll see you next month. Thank you. Thank you.